socialism uh, at the crisis in Venezuela. I'd like to start first by thanking our Instant Issues sponsors, uh, Wilbraham and Munson Academy, Sir Speedy, and special thanks to NAA Platkin and 1350 Main Street LLC, who are the managers of this building and who have supported the World Affairs Council in many ways over the years. And let me move on to introducing our speaker today, uh, who comes to us with thanks for, for the recommendation uh, from Joan Grenier of uh, Odyssey Bookshop, who uh, recommended our today's uh, speaker. So I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Alejandro Velasco, Associate Professor of History at New York University's Gallatin School of Individualized Study. And he is uh, just back from a trip uh, to Venezuela, so I think this will be a very timely uh, presentation. Uh, Professor Velasco is a historian of modern Latin America whose research and teaching interests are in the areas of uh, social movements, urban culture, and democratization. Uh, his book, uh, Barrio Rising, Urban Popular Politics and the Making of Venezuela, uh, couples archival ethnographic research to examine how residents of Venezuela's largest public housing community pursued full citizenship during the heyday of Latin America's once model democracy. And yes, by the way, we do have, again, thanks to Joan Grenier, uh, copies here for sale. Uh, which I'm sure our speaker will be happy to autograph for you. Um, I am told that uh, checks and cash only. Um, before joining uh, the Gallatin faculty, Professor Velasco taught at Hampshire College, where he was a five college fellow, and at Duke University. Uh, and at Gallatin, his courses include uh, Reimagining Latin America, Revolucion, Incivility in the Age of Civil Society, uh, and art and politics in the city, which is, sounds very exciting. It, it's a multi-sided collaboration between NYU Buenos Aires and NYU Washington Square. Uh, his research has won major funding support. This is an impressive list. From Social Science Research Council, the American Historical so Association, Ford Foundation, and the Mellon Foundation. You write grant applications well, I think. <laughs> Um, uh, and he's also presented widely at both national and international conferences and symposia. So he will be speaking to us today on oil, socialism, uh, and the crisis in Venezuela. Uh, please join me in welcoming Alejandro Velasco. So thank you so much for the introduction and also for the invitation, Sid. Yes, indeed, you have this clairvoyance about you. We started talking about this talk back in the fall. Um, and even though at the time, I, uh, she, uh, Sid was kindly reminding me every couple of weeks to bring a title and an abstract or something for the talk, and I kept trying to delay saying, well, things are changing. It's a little bit unclear. Um, it's clear that she at least knew something was happening. Um, so uh, what I want to do is just tell you a little bit about um, what I had in mind, which is actually slightly different from what I'm actually going to do. So I wrote the remarks that I'm going to give in a slightly truncated version, actually, when I was in Caracas earlier this year, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, uh, I was there for three weeks between January 10th and, um, well, January 22nd, which is uh, the day that uh, right before everything that has happened over the past month has actually started to go down. Um, and I should say that um, as somebody who's from Venezuela, you know, grew up and was raised in Venezuela, um, who does research in Venezuela, whose first talk as a graduate student in 2001 on Venezuela was titled Venezuela in Crisis. Um, you know, so I feel like I've been giving a variation of a theme for the last um, 17 years. Um, nevertheless, I was completely caught off guard, and I think many of my colleagues as well, by not only the, the speed and rapidity with which events have really unfolded over the last um, you know, three, three and a half weeks, but also the sense uh, that there is very little, um, there, there seems to be no plan B. And that's quite frightening um, because, of course, in the absence of a plan B, then the only options are escalation. Um, and escalation in the context, as I'll talk about in a little bit, of a, um, of a not only 
domestic uh, conflict, which is the, the subject of my particular remarks, but increasingly so uh, you know, a proxy conflict between major world powers, including, of course, the United States, but also Russia, China, and to a lesser extent, Turkey. Um, as I just wrote about in an editorial in the New York Times, it's Venezuelans themselves who stand to suffer most in a, in a proxy conflict. Um, so it's a real source of concern for, uh, for myself, of course, personally as somebody who has you know, uh, family and, and many friends in Venezuela, but also professionally in terms of thinking about how, um, how not to repeat mistakes of the past in terms of um, not only U.S. foreign policy, but um, you know, the, the strong echoes, even though I look young, I was actually alive for the Cold War, um, you know, strong echoes that, that, uh, that certainly I am hearing. Um, that are positioning these global powers in a stalemate uh, where Venezuela is just one piece of the larger uh, puzzle, right? So um, what I did was I wrote these remarks while I was in Venezuela, um, intending mainly to think about the, the broader kind of overarching issues around economy, politics, and society that have brought Venezuela to the place where it is now. Um, but um, and all, all of it still applies, but what I want to do is also then talk a little bit about my views of what has been going on over the past three and a half weeks. Um, and then hopefully from there, just open it up to discussion. So the first half of my remarks are going to be prepared, and the second half are going to be a little bit more extemporaneous. Okay? So um, one, of the, uh, one of the things in terms of thinking about Venezuela that people often remark um, especially those who have only a passing or are only beginning to think about Venezuela, is this tremendous um, kind of contradiction where on one hand Venezuela you know, sits atop the world's largest proven oil reserves. We're talking about 500 billion barrels of oil. It's a literal sort of ocean of oil. Um, and yet nevertheless, it's undergoing a severe crisis. Um, and so you know, partly what I want to do is think a little bit about what explains that. Um, and also to maybe unpack some of the more, um, to my mind as an historian, um, you know, uh, problematic interpretations as to why Venezuela is where it is. So yes, Venezuela is home to the world's largest proven oil reserves, estimated, as I mentioned, at about 500 billion, billion barrels. It sits strategically at the crossroads of the Americas with ready access to US um, and European markets. It's a country that's neither especially large nor especially populous, at once highly urban and rich in fertile lands. It boasts enviable infrastructure, even though, of course, this infrastructure has been, um, uh, uh, has, has suffered as a result of the crisis, but in terms of ports, high levels of connectivity, plentiful natural resources, roads, et cetera, it's all there. Um, and for over 100 years, um, it has mercifully escaped the scourge of wars, whether foreign and domestic. And yet, as you know, not just the recent headlines, but even before, um, are staggering, right? Severe food shortages, horrible crime rates, the world's highest inflation estimated by the IMF at upwards of a million percent. Um, in dystopic hospitals, medicine is scarce, and diseases that had long since been eradicated um, have begun to reappear. By some estimates, nearly three million people, mostly um, uh, initially middle class professionals and youth, but um, over the last year, year and a half, incorporating far more popular sector populations, the urban poor, have left Venezuela over the past um, you know, decade uh, uh, seeking opportunities elsewhere. They've mostly gone to Colombia, uh, Brazil, or Ecuador, which are the, the primary neighboring countries, but also Peru, Chile, Argentina, and then from an earlier wave of migration in the early 2000s, um, you know, to places like Europe, the United States, and even Australia. Meanwhile, a, a corrupt, ever more authoritarian and unpopular government led by uh, President Nicolás Maduro, who took office after Hugo Chávez died from cancer in 2003, battles a what had been a long splintered opposition, which long lacked in political alternatives, turning politics in Venezuela into a zero-sum stalemate after nearly two decades of deeply bitter polarization. Um, and increasingly, we hear reports of a precipitous decline in oil production due to mismanagement, which means not just a short-term cash flow problem as crude prices remain low in, um, relative to uh, to historic levels, but long-term ones, long-term problems that impair the country's future capacity to generate wealth from its major source of income. 
as the country mortgages uh, future oil production in order to finance both old and new debt um, in order just to stay afloat. Um, and of course, the most recent development is that there have been you know, uh, severe sanctions imposed on the uh, Venezuelan oil industry by the um, Trump administration, which even further restrict the ability of the uh, Maduro government to be able to, um, to finance uh, imports. So the scene then is not just of a, of a crisis, but of a series of intersecting crises, social, political, and economic, a sort of perfect storm of crises that are all colliding and exploding at the same time, feeding off each other like a seemingly unstoppable chain reaction. And it shouldn't be this way, or should it? And there are two frequently touted explanations for Venezuela's current crisis. Each one of these explanations is elegant, it's, it's convincing and, and wrong, dangerously so. Um, and so I just want to parse through them a little bit. So one popular trope blames oil as both the source of the country's riches and its misery. Venezuela has been pumping oil commercially since 1914, turning the country in the first half of the 20th century from what was a sleepy provincial country into a modern nation. Periods of exponential growth, however, were always followed by major oil busts, which each success, with each successive cycle expanding a breach between, uh, between rich and poor that required even greater spending during the following boom to try to resolve. Now, there are te uh, technical terms for this dynamic. Dutch disease, uh, petrostate, resource curse, paradox of plenty. Economists and political scientists have explored this in depth. But at root, the logic is you know, simple enough. Countries whose economies depend on a single commodity, prone to wild price fluctuations, as is oil, are notoriously poor at long-term planning. So when oil prices soar, dollars are plentiful, not just because of the windfall revenues, but be also because wealth makes it easy to acquire debt. Right? It's easier to, to get debt if people think you can pay for it as banks and financial institutions are eager to cash in on the current as well as projected wealth of oil nations. As a result, countries spend both what they have and what they anticipate having. Now, for an example closer to home, think, of, for instance, of the financial crisis of 2008, right, which is basically resting on the assumption that uh, property prices were just going to continue to go up and up and up. And so people finance mortgages as well as refinancing of their existing properties with ever less, um, uh, you know, with, with ever less collateral because banks were uh, you know, uh, basically giving money on the assumption that the, uh, the property prices were going to continue to go up. And so you could turn it around eventually if you wanted to sell it, right? Similar situation with oil um, in this particular context. So in turn, Easy access to dollars means that it's more profitable in the short term to buy imported products rather than to invest in local industry, especially when domestic markets are small and the ex uh, expected returns are minor. So the example that, for instance, I often give my students is shoes. Right? So say that you're country X and you have a small population, a smallish population, um, you know, to invest in the production of shoes for your country requires a tremendous amount of upstart costs, right? Not just the cost for building a, a, a you know, factory or multiple factories, but machinery, infrastructure that goes around that factory, of course, labor costs, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have this tremendous windfall of cash, it's far easier in the short term just to finance imports of shoes rather than to um, you know, to, to you know, build a domestic industry of shoes, which would not see returns on that investment for a long period of time, number one. Number two, there's also the issue of competition. Right? If you're trying to upstart or to jumpstart a, a domestic industry, um, at the same time trying to compete with an international market, marketplace of shoes, why would people buy the Venezuelan shoe instead of Nike, for instance? Right? I mean, it's, uh, it's a question of quality there at the same time. So it's much, the incentives are rigged in favor of imports rather than domestic investment in uh, productive apparatus. Of course, when oil prices fall, often as abruptly as they rose, the cash that's needed to maintain high import levels dries up. And having failed to invest in domestic industry, goods now grow scarce and more expensive. Meanwhile, debt that was contracted in times of plenty 
means major loan payments, which governments finance by depressing the value of local currency in order to shore up dollars. In the process, <coughs> making local money worth less and less and driving up inflation more and more. So you have the classic problem of stagnation and inflation, stagflation coming together. And they do this in part by printing cash, or in the case of Venezuela, by both printing cash and restricting access to dollars, creating therefore also the additional incentive for black market. Right? So that if you only have a limited access to dollars, then what that means is, and your domestic currency is becoming worth less and less, then you want to have access to dollars, and so you're willing to pay a lot for that. And so therefore, the, the, not only does uh, the valuation of the currency increase, but of course, the black market for dollar rises in, um, exponentially. I'll just give you, you know, one particular no, uh, figure. So at one time, for a long time, the official uh, dollar uh, exchange rate in Venezuela was pegged at around 10 bolivares, which is the local currency, to one dollar. So that if you had a preferential access to, um, to dollars, you could get it at 10 bolivares. Of course, people who had access to that preferential rate were those in the inner circle of the government, um, et cetera. And so they were provided this access in part to be able to, serve, for instance, finance import of food, medicine, other kinds of products. But because of the printing of cash and the devaluation of the currency of inorganic money, right, the, in, the breach between the official rate and do, um, the dollars grew to as much as 200,000 to one, <laughs> right? And so imagine if you have dollars that you purchased a 10 to 1, but the black market rate is 200,000 to 1. You would be an idiot not to, of course, sell those dollars at the black market rate. And there, you know, in the absence of any kind of controls or uh, significant amounts of transparency, the incentives therefore become enormous for this kind of corruption. It's a sordid tale, and for Venezuela, sadly, it's a familiar one. In the 1950s, a military dictatorship spent lavishly amidst an oil boom, and this is what I recount in my book, um, uh, amidst an oil boom before liberal democratic regime replaced it ahead of an oil bust in the 1960s, leaving the budding democratic government to fend with the accumulated debt and rising poverty. Then, in the 1970s, as the Mideast oil embargo shot prices to historic highs and Venezuela embarked on an um, uh, uh, a spending and debt spree even more spectacular than the one before, raising the quality of life um, of Venezuelans and making Venezuela the envy of the region. So we had this boom and bust cycle between the 1950s and 1970s. But when oil prices collapsed in the early 1980s, two decades of rising inequality, political turmoil, and social unrest followed before Venezuelans in 1999, elected as president, or 1998, elected as President Hugo Chavez, a former military officer who had promised to make government more responsive to the needs of those left out of the oil pie. And he did. When crude prices again rose sharply in the early 2000s, and we can talk about the reasons why, primarily it has to do with the invasion of Iraq, right, which then depressed the supply of oil in the, um, in the global marketplace. Um, and also some concerted moves on the part of OPEC, of which Venezuela is one of the founding member members. Um, that shot prices, I'll just give this statistic, sometimes students get really um, you know, sort of blown away by this. Does anybody care to guess what the price of barrel, per barrel of oil was in 1999 when Hugo Chavez was first installed as president? $10 a barrel. At the height of the oil boom, around 2010, guesses? 150, <laughs> right? So we go from $10 a barrel in 1999 to $150 a barrel in 2010. This is an exponential windfall of revenue. We're talking about the most, um, uh, you know, the most significant amounts of cash infusion, not just in Venezuela, but circulating elsewhere. And, in Latin America, this meant a commodity boom in other countries of the region, which then um, helped to elect left-wing uh, governments that we now subsequently have called the, the pink tie or the left turn. Um, but this is just to give you a bit of a sense of the, just the scale of the amount of cash that was coming in. And so he used this cash to implement massive public spending um, 
and social programs that he had later dubbed socialism of the 21st century. Now these programs dramatically and demonstrably alleviated poverty. And as before, when oil prices began to plummet in 2014, so did the gains of the boom years. And of course now they have been all but completely wiped out and in some cases even significantly reversed. Right? So the Venezuelan governments of different stripes, right, dictatorships, liberal democratic, so-called socialists, have succumbed to the highs and lows of oil swan song makes this petrostate um, explanation compelling. It suggests a structural problem that goes beyond who is in power or how or any kind of ideological proclivity. But what it doesn't explain is why the scale and the scope of the current crisis is decidedly more severe than during previous boom and bust periods. That this in turn has led some to point to a different culprit and that culprit is socialism. Now, Venezuela's governments have squandered, as I mentioned before, revenue windfalls, but today's dire and deteriorating situation cannot be pinned on a resource curse. This is what the explanation holds. Instead, blame lies with Chavez's ideological program, which increased state control over the economy, expropriated private property, imposed high taxes and regulations on business, nationalized industry, massively expanded social welfare, ballooned the size of government, and concentrated power in the state, all while chasing away investors. And in fact, troubling signs of economic weakness had already begun to surface prior to the 2014 collapse of oil prices, indicating that something other than a mere commodity boom and bust cycle was at play. But pointing to socialism ignores that Chavez didn't even suggest such a turn until 2005, seven years after he took office. And he didn't even set out to implement anything that could remotely be understood as socialism, and even tentatively at that until 2006. Instead, for several years prior, Venezuela's government undertook a series of measures that would eventually set its economy on a familiar path to volatility and crisis. So, in 2003, Chavez won control over the oil industry, nationalized in 1976 originally, and then uh, in the 1990s period, especially of, as I mentioned before, really low oil prices, was reprivatized um, in, in some sectors, following what had been a disastrous month-long um, uh, industry strike that pit um, company uh, managers intent on running the company as a private enterprise against a government determined to redirect profits of the national oil industry into social spending. Then in 2004, facing dropping popularity rates and a potential recall, which he eventually won, re a recall referendum, Chavez began to roll out a series of social programs that took advantage of the then incipient post-Iraq invasion oil boom. Now these highly popular and deeply expensive programs would become the centerpiece of a distributive agenda that Chavez rode from victory to electoral victory until his death while in office in 2013. And as the boom grew, so did spending and debt, mainly again on programs aimed at improving health, education and food access for Venezuela's poor, and in the process lifting, again demonstrably, millions of Venezuelans out of poverty. What Chavez's spending did not do, however, as had happened previously, was invest significantly in domestic production, relying instead, again, on imports and immediate assistance that increased consumption levels, which created a kind of paradoxical relationship on the one hand between a discourse and rhetoric of socialism, but a practice or a policy in place that actually um, promoted consumerism. Um, while leaving much of Venezuela's private sector, from banks to manufacturing, in private hands. Hardly a model of socialism. Meanwhile, enormous amounts of money went into artificially keeping afloat uh, Venezuela's currency through strict exchange controls that were imposed in 2003. Now, far from a socialist plot, Currency controls in 2003 were an emergency response to the oil industry strike that I mentioned before that left Venezuela in desperate need of cash. By limiting the amount of, um, of dollars that individuals and businesses could purchase in the open market, the government therefore could shore up dollars and therefore stem capital flight. This was the logic behind the uh, currency exchange controls. 
However, as the immediate crisis abated, currency controls began to do little more than to fuel opportunities for corruption. As those, as I mentioned before, with access to dollars um, at the preferential rate, at the official rate, sold them to black market rates as people in, uh, increasingly wanted, rather than domestic currency, to have their um, have dollars. Moreover, as the oil boom, the, moreover, the oil boom that I've mentioned before is simultaneously masked and fed corruption as dollars were incredibly plentiful, right? So again, just the, the, the statistic that I gave before about $10 a barrel to $150 a barrel, the amount of money that that uh, allows you to, to play with as a government both feeds corruption, especially through this currency exchange scheme, but also masks it because there's just so much money to go around, right? So you don't have to kind of uh, bear the brunt of the, um, of the crisis. But when dollars became scarce, as oil prices plummeted, the breach between the two no longer held. Authorities um, last year began to move away from the currency exchange controls, but not for ideological reasons, but because so many officials are now wrapped up in the web of corruption. Black market demand for dollars to finance imports of everything from food to medicine to replacement parts have depressed local currency and driven inflation, as I mentioned um, before, to upwards of you know, a million percent and perhaps more. And I, not happy to, but I'm glad to talk about what actually that means in practice walking around Caracas, um, uh, the capital. All of which points to a simple but unexciting reality. Neither is oil a curse in itself, nor is socialism a recipe for disaster. Instead, the combination of an incoherent socialist program made classic petrostate problems all the more severe drawing from the worst features of each. Yet, there is comfort in blaming either oil or socialism exclusively for Venezuela's crisis. Both have elements of truth, as I mentioned. They are also, however, incomplete, mainly because neither actually <coughs> seeks to explain so much as to blame or to absolve for reasons of political gamesmanship. So, those who offer up the petrostate explanation do so primarily to shift the way, attention away from Chavez, aiming to burnish his image and political appeal for posterity by shielding gains made during his tenure from the crisis that many of his policies have left after his death. Meanwhile, those who blame socialism willfully downplay how policies familiar to previous boom eras, policies undertaken again by governments of very different stripes before, drive the current crisis. Instead, they seek to keep alive the claim that many have tried and failed before, that Venezuela's chief barrier to lasting prosperity is its leaders and their management of the oil dependency, not the dependency of oil itself. Now, let me just bracket here and say, well, you know, the, the question that I often get is, well, why not just save oil? Uh, revenues, right? Why not have like a rainy day fund? And in fact, Norway is the model that is often thought about. So Norway's major um, oil exporting period began in the 1970s and 1960s, and they developed something called a macro stabilization fund, right? And the macro stabilization <coughs> fund basically pegs the budget, the operating budget of the country to an historic average of oil prices and says that if there is, for instance, an oil boom, any revenue that comes in above the price of that barrel of oil has to, by law, go immediately into this fund. And then if it drops below that number, then you can draw from that fund to maintain that budget that you've created through this you know, um, historic uh, mean. Of course, Norway not only is it a far smaller country, but it's also much more homogeneous. And in addition, doesn't have lasting legacies of inequality to try to resolve and attend to in a moment of oil boom, especially in the context of an electoral politics where, of course, it would be extremely difficult for any politician to say, in the context, for instance, as we're seeing now, of severe crisis, to say, you know what, we are sitting atop these 500 billion barrels of oil, but we're not actually going to generate enough revenue, or the, gener the revenue that we generate, we're not gonna spend on alleviating your present crisis. We need to put it away in a lockbox. If somebody is suffering through a humanitarian crisis, that does not quite compute, right? Especially if you have a political and electoral system where 
you know, you want to win office. So that's a complicated question in terms of whether or not you can actually, in a context of severe crisis and rising inequality, actually resort to, to the rainy day fund, um, such as in the case of Norway. So another example that is often given is, well, what about you know, Saudi Arabia and, and the Middle East? They, you know, they obviously depend on this single commodity, and clearly they don't have um, you know, the problems that, that we see in, in Venezuela. Well, of course, there's two questions. Do you value democracy or not? Right, um, number one. And number two, right, um, much of, in the, certainly the case of Saudi Arabia, but elsewhere um, in the Gulf, right, many of these countries rely on imported labor with tremendously adverse um, you know, conditions from South India or South Asia and other parts um, ha who have no citizenship rights or really any kind of political rights, which is, of course, not even to mention the issue of women and whether they have political rights. So you know, either way, whether it's a question of how do you deal with a heterogeneous society that already has significant levels of inequality to try to create a macro civilization fund, or do you actually believe in values of democracy and uh, you know, uh, pluralism, um, it, these models don't quite hold for Venezuela. So ultimately, what the battle over incomplete explanations highlights is a more fundamental and troubling feature of Venezuela's political culture. One that helps answer why, despite such clear lessons, Venezuela again and again finds itself in familiar predicaments. And that is that the seeds of the country's next crisis are found in the throes of the previous crisis. And I firmly believe that this moment of crisis is planting the seeds for the next crisis when rather than explanations, Venezuelans seek to blame. And one of the ways that this is happening right now right, is uh, you know, certain sectors, not all sectors, but certain sectors of the opposition in Venezuela are saying, look, all we have to do is basically go back to 1999, because the previous 20 years were complete failure. Nothing good came out of it. And so if we just kind of ignore what just happened over the last 20 years and retake up the thread, then we'll be OK. And of course, what that does is ignore the lessons of the previous 20 years, number one. But number two, more problematically, it also ignores that significant sectors of the population not only voted for Chavez because of the collapse of the previous regime, but also supported Chavez in the context of this oil boom period. right? And so even though they have come to uh, increasingly stand in opposition to Maduro, that does not immediately equate to support for the opposition. Right, so completely denying the last 20 years, in part, is setting the stage for a deeper governability crisis in the short term and perhaps even in the medium term. But in the long term, the deeper problem is that there is no actual alternative to oil dependency as the way out of the current economic crisis in Venezuela. So if you see, for instance, some of the measures that um, Juan Guaido, who's the National Assembly president, who you know, invoked an article of the Constitution to um, declare himself interim president, um, uh, he has already announced policies that aim at increasing productive levels of the, um, of the oil economy, which have collapsed to about a million barrels of oil, to bring it back up to five million barrels of oil, which was the aim in the 1990s, to try to get control of a greater market share, right, and therefore to be able to use those revenues to satisfy the needs of the population. Again, repeating that same dependency um, uh, paradox that I was talking about before. So again and again, Blame has meant dismissing all that has come before for reasons of political survival in the process discarding even the ability to learn from the past. Right? So these moments of crisis generate not just a, um, a shortage of products, but they also generate an incentive for amnesia. Right? Insofar as they create the conditions for ignoring the lessons for, of what just happened, because all that needs to happen is to found the republic anew. And this is no, you know, there's no, it's not coincidental that um, in the wake of the last dictatorship that I mentioned that was overthrown in 1958, a new constitution was created that was there, that gave rise to the Fourth Republic, so called. And then when Chavez was elected, he created a new constitution which gave rise to the Fifth Republic, right? And so it's not going to be surprising if whatever happens over the next few months, perhaps years, a new constitution is formed and you have a Sixth Republic, which of course conceptually suggests that each of these instances of transition are seen as breaks with the past, as complete origins of something entirely new. And that sense of newness is what inhibits the opportunity to be able to actually reflect upon the reasons for the previous crisis. So that's a larger argument. Okay, let me now transition to a little bit, to talk a little bit more simultaneously about um, 
uh, what's been happening and sort of my, my larger takes on it. So um, uh, as I mentioned before, I was extremely surprised on January 23rd when Juan Guaido, the National Assembly President, who had been installed as National Assembly President earlier in January, uh, invoked an article of the Constitution to say that the executive office, the executive branch, has been vacated because of the opposition's, broadly speaking, lack of recognition of Nicolás Maduro's election last May that granted him a new six-year term of office. That election was plagued by irregularities, not only on the day of vote itself, but also lead up to the vote in terms of unfair conditions that um, met many opposition candidates, especially major candidates, were either barred from running for office or jailed or in exile. So uh, these elections were by no means free and fair, and the opposition drew on that um, to say that, well, if he uh, is sworn into a new six-year term of office, then not only will we not recognize that legitimacy, but we will invoke this article of the Constitution to say that power of the executive vests onto uh, the National Assembly president as the only democratically elected uh, uh, body in Venezuela. The problem, of course, with Article 233 is that it also because it, um, it's designed in a context of an absolute vacuum of power in the executive, which of course is not what exists in practice. Maduro is there and he controls especially the military. Um, uh, also is designed to hold new elections very quickly in a 30 day period. And of course this can't happen because most of the institutions of the state are controlled by Maduro and the government, right? And so to actually undertake the kind of major electoral transitions that would be required to hold free and fair elections would mean much longer than 30 days. And so there's a question there that, um, there's an issue there that, uh, that goes beyond legality. And to the extent that so much of the uh, discussion around you know, whether Maduro is president legally or whether um, uh, Guaido is president legally misses the larger point, which is this is really a battle over legitimacy, not over legality. Right, and understood in the context of legitimacy, then we have a clearer sense of, well, what are the actual stakes and who are the actual power brokers? And here's where now we can, um, I'll just mention briefly, why we got to this particular moment when we did. So as I mentioned, of course, this tremendous crisis has been ongoing. Crises have been happening in Venezuela, as I talked about before, since 2001, or these perceived crises. Uh, but there's something very particular about this moment. Number one, you have this issue of um, who actually claims the legitimate, um, legitimacy over the presidency. But number two, the, uh, the government of Nicolás Maduro itself lacked a significant amount of legitimacy among sectors that it previously held close to its support, in particular popular sectors, barrios, the urban poor. These are the people who have been primarily, and not primarily, but most severely affected by the economic crisis. And they have been increasingly turning away from support for Maduro. However, that does not mean, as I mentioned before, support for the opposition. And the reason why has to do both with historic, longer term reasons and more um, short term reasons. The shorter term reasons, thinking about the sort of time center of the, um, the last 20 years, is that the opposition largely has failed significantly in two ways. Number one, they have lacked any kind of significant um, alternative for next day. Right? So their primary uh, places of unity have been, we need to get rid of either Chavez, we need to get rid of either Maduro, but because there's so much heterogeneity, ideological, um, as well as in terms of party structure within the, um, within the opposition, they can't actually come together on a next day plan. Right? And so in the absence of that plan, um, popular sectors who suffer through various fronts of crises say, well, I don't know what a new government would do. Yes, we're suffering now, but if we think historically, those previous governments, especially if there's a, or those, those um, you know, folks in the opposition, especially if they were talking about getting rid of the entire last 20 years, some of which were actually really good for me, or for us, right? Um, I don't want to live through that. Um, and so there's a deep sense of uncertainty in the absence of an actual concrete alternative. Um, that, the Venice, that the Maduro government has tapped really well into to say, well, if they come to power, they're just gonna implement austerity, they're going to uh, cut back on any kinds of social programs and perhaps even repress you as, as popular sectors because that has happened um, you know, in the past before, or has happened before. So there's that significant lack of um, connection on the part of the opposition. But the other part of it too, 
in the, in the context of the lack of an actual political um, alternative. But the other problem that the opposition has had and has faced um, over the last 20 years is that it hasn't been able to even articulate, not even a lack of, or, or a plan for the next day, but an outreach to popular sectors, especially in the context of organizing. And that has to do for two reasons. Number one, there's deep levels of distrust on the part of popular sectors towards the opposition because of some early moves that the opposition took in the early 2000s. And we were talking about this before um, with the um, uh, lady here who's from Venezuela. Um, uh, the first initial moves in the part of the opposition to try to resist or oppose Chavez were deeply anti-democratic. Right? There was a, a failed coup in 2002 um, uh, that then resulted in a spectacularly botched, um, very brief interim government that then uh, Chavez was able to um, return from with significant amounts of, um, uh, of increased power, which also allowed him to purge the military. Um, then in 2002, 2003, as I mentioned before, the opposition decided, well, we're just going to, um, especially because the, you know, they controlled the, the managerial sectors of the oil industry, we're going to lock out the oil industry. And though that created significant amounts of problems and um, turmoil for about a month and a half time, especially among, again, sort of popular sectors. And then Chavez was able to ride that lockout and eventually, therefore, also fire 18,000 workers from the oil industry and stack, therefore, the oil industry with his own loyalists. So therefore, given control um, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the government. And then in 2004, as I mentioned, there was a recall referendum which the opposition lost, but certain sectors of the opposition refused to accept the result, saying that there was fraud. And no fraud has been factually proven. Instead, there was a sense that no, we could not have lost. It was impossible that we lost, rather than any sort of evidence-based reasons for why that would be the case. But this was extremely injurious for the opposition, which otherwise could have begun to articulate a more democratic sort of vision and instead led to, in 2005, during parliamentary elections, a general boycott of those parliamentary elections. Which, of course, if you are Chavez, is great. Because if you have now control over the entire assembly, because the opposition has boycotted, now you control the military, the oil industry, and the legislature. And especially in the context of the legislature, not because you know <laughs> did anything at the time to be able to um, you know, to run around the opposition, because, but rather because they took themselves from, um, from, that, um, from that space. And so all these things together created a deep sense by which the opposition, at least at that time, was not actually committed to the democracy that they said that they wanted to promote and defend. Right? The opposition since then has very slowly and with tremendous difficulty retaken up a democratic path. Uh, culminating in 2015 with the victory over the National Assembly. They retook control over the National Assembly. And then, of course, that was a period of time when Maduro, as I mentioned before, of the falling oil prices, the increasing prices, then now resorted to full authoritarianism to try to circumvent the National Assembly and create parallel institutions that marginalized this democratically elected National Assembly which therefore gave the opposition a democratic upper hand. However, because of these deep wells of distrust, continues to create this tremendous um, lack of connection between an opposition that has a legitimate claim to, um, you know, to democratic credentials now and uh, popular sectors who have, are significantly disenchanted with the government but do not yet see themselves in the light of, um, of the opposition. What does that mean? Well, of course, partly what that means is that you have this significant amount of stalemate in Venezuela, especially those who are deepest and hardest hit have very little place to go. Meanwhile, and this is one of the strange kind of paradoxes of what's happening right now in Venezuela, tremendous, as the, uh, you're, you're probably familiar with, um, tremendous amounts of activity has happened in the international landscape. But very little is actually going on in Venezuela. There's been massive demonstration. There's been massive demonstrations before, but Surprisingly, those demonstrations have been actually quite uh, peaceful. Very little, to, in fact, very almost minimal repression, which is different from the kinds of protest movements in 2017 and 2014, which were severely repressed by the government. Right? So the government of Maduro knows that any kind of violence would be a pretext right, to completely change the landscape, especially in terms of a potential sort of international intervention. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, again, in the context of, um, of this changed landscape that is now 
far more rooted in what's happening internationally than domestically, the stakes and interests of the various, and this is what I was alluding to before, of the various geopolitical powers are making, are making very, very difficult maintaining focus on the crisis on the ground. And instead, we're seeing different interests at stake in order to be able to play out their geopolitical differences. And so I'll just briefly lay out what I see as those geopolitical differences. So of course, the United States has been very vocal, although not the leader, uh, not the sole um, uh, supporter of the opposition of, Nicol uh, of Juan Guaido, um, although they were the first to recognize him as uh, the legitimate president. Um, mere minutes after he, um, uh, after he uh, invoked this article on January 23rd of 1958. But they have been certainly the most vocal in asserting uh, not only the legitimacy of Guaido, but their plan to oust Maduro, right? And so people like John Bolton, who's the national security advisor, people like Marco Rubio, who of course is senator from Florida, which is a huge site of Venezuelans in exile or who have left over the last 20 years. And so therefore that colors the domestic pol politics in, um, in Florida. Or people like Elliot Abrams, who has uh, been appointed as a special envoy to Venezuela, on Venezuela by the Trump administration, and whose record of, um, of intervention in Latin America extending to the 1980s, uh, you know, height of the Cold War, is atrocious. All of which, uh, so they have all said variously that uh, one of our primary interests, our in terms of the United States, is um, having better uh, uh, you know, access to the oil industry. In Venezuela, which of course easily fits into this trope, as we've seen before, that oil is at the center um, of, uh, of U.S. strategy uh, internationally, despite talk of democracy and human rights promotion. Um, but it's not actually oil that is at stake in Venezuela. Yes, oil matters. But what's more significant for the United States, and again, leading this charge, is taking advantage of a moment of significant hemispheric regional shift. So as I talked about before, during this period of oil boom and commodity boom prices, many left of center governments began to be elected throughout Latin America. And one of the primary um, uh, efforts, the united efforts of these um, left-wing governments was to isolate and marginalize what had previously been a significant amount of power of the United States to be able to set the agenda, especially around Washington consensus era policies of neoliberal austerity, privatization, and free trade. Right? So as more of these left-wing governments came to power, the United States lost relevance and influence in the region. The, uh, the commodity bust that has been going on now for five years, as well as, again, as I talked about before, not just in Venezuela, but in places like Brazil, um, places like Argentina, places like Peru, significant amounts of corruption scandals that really plague many of these left-wing governments has resulted in an electoral tide back towards more conservative governments who are uh, um, openly much more um, in tune with, uh, with United States uh, policies, especially around free trade. So for instance, Jair Bolsonaro, who was just elected uh, and inaugurated as president of Brazil in early, um, in early January of this year, you know, he's made some extremely troubling remarks about, number one, well, certainly in terms of culture and, and political rights about um, LGBT communities, Afro-Brazilian communities, et cetera, the impoverished communities of, of Brazil, but also has uh, openly indicated that their primary aim is to open up the Amazon to investment, to uh, mining, to, um, uh, to, oil, uh, to oil digging, et cetera, et cetera, right? Which, of course, you know, we can talk about what that would do in terms of climate. But the, the, the more important thing is that oil in Venezuela is just one small piece of a larger continental uh, effort to reassert uh, influence that had been lost over the previous 20 years. Right? And this isn't just the United States. Canada, for instance, has been very, very vocal as well in articulating their position um, in support of, uh, of Juan Guaido. And you know, Justin Trudeau is very cute. He has great you know, feminist language. Um, talks well about climate change, but Canada abroad, their primary interest, especially in Latin America, is mining. Canada is the primary, um, uh, uh, Canada's primary presence in Latin America, in countries like Colombia, in countries like, uh, like Peru, in places like Central America, is through mining, especially of natural resources. And so for them, the, uh, the potential to um, uh, have greater uh, ties to a place like Brazil by promoting and sort of linking up with this um, Jair Bolsonaro government is, is too, too rich to pass up. Um, so that's sort of the U.S. interest, I think, has to be understood in those terms of reasserting a lost 
place of ascendance that had been um, sacrificed or at least uh, you know, marginalized over the previous 20 years of left-wing uh, left governance. For Russia and China, which are supporting Maduro, the stakes are far different. China's stakes in Venezuela run billions and billions of dollars, upwards of 50, perhaps even as, many, as much as $60 billion, which has been granted to the Maduro government over the last two or three years, more like five years, but really significantly over the last two or three years, as a series of sanctions have come in which have made it very difficult for the uh, Venezuelan government to raise credit and debt abroad through bonds, for instance. Right? So there's all sorts of restrictions on purchasing Venezuelan bonds that were imposed by the Trump administration when it first um, when it first came to power. Um, and so that has basically pushed Maduro further into the fold of China, whose interest in Venezuela is basically just oil. Right? It needs oil to be able to, um, uh, to finance its own growth, to, um, to keep afloat. Um, and uh, Venezuela has not only uh, sort of taken some of its cash, but has also given tremendously generous concessions to Chinese firms in terms, as I said about before, mortgaging basically Venezuela's oil industry uh, toward the future. So their stakes in Venezuela are, well, you know, if Maduro leaves office, and what happens to all the investments that we made? Is the new government going to recognize um, uh, the stakes that we have uh, that we have uh, planted in terms of future oil production, or are they going? Are we going to left, be left out on the lurch? Interestingly, of course, the not of course, but interestingly, the opposition has been quite smart in saying, "Look, China, we know that you have a lot at stake here. We're not going to immediately cancel the contracts that you conducted with Maduro." We might renegotiate them, but the idea here is not to put you out of the picture completely. It's unclear whether China sees that as sincere or whether they, um, whether they'll actually turn on Maduro. Russia's interest is far more mundane, and let's just call it far more, um, uh, you know, uh, far more um, territorial. Right? Russia's interest is to try as much as possible to isolate the United States' reach in the world, especially as it becomes far more confrontational vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Right? And insofar as Russia has a foothold in Venezuela by way of their close ties to the Maduro government, that allows them to have an influence that is not actually, and this is a slightly com uh, confusing point, is not actually about Latin America or influence in Latin America, but it's about their ability to be able to exert influence elsewhere in the globe. So one of the, my, my primary concerns, for instance, is that um, uh, Venezuela is not Syria, right? Insofar as Russia can't easily allocate uh, military uh, materiel or personnel or uh, you know, planes or warships, et cetera, it's ha much harder to take them all the way to, you know, to, through the Atlantic into the Caribbean Ocean. So the military option for Russia is not actually quite there. But that doesn't mean that, of course, they can't exert pressure elsewhere in the globe, say Crimea or further parts of Ukraine. There was this moment, and not to be too conspiratorial, about a week and a half ago, perhaps you all uh, know better, um, where I had these, you know, this moment of, oh, my, I see it all. Now it's clear. And that was when um, the United States announced that it was withdrawing from the 1987 Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile Treaty that was signed between Ronald Reagan and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev as a pr it's one of the marquee uh, moments of um, Cold War um, detente. Um, and it was sort of seen because, of course, uh, not to get too technical about it, but the real threat of Cold War you know, thermonuclear conflict, uh, in, uh, nuclear conflict was these intermediate ballistic range missiles, which did not have the long range capacity to be able to you know, have a, a, a graduated response, right? And so these were the missiles that were right along the, uh, the Iron Curtain, uh, you know, in Turkey or in Poland, et cetera, et cetera, were the primary sources of, uh, of tension. And so as the, the next day that uh, the United States announced that it was a drawing from the treaty, Russia said, well, maybe we'll just put some, um, some missiles in Crimea. I'm like, oh my god, here we go again, right? So the issue is that, the, the, um, that Russia has far more levers to play elsewhere in the world. And so in this case, Venezuela becomes a site to be able to contain US influence rather than anything that's particular about, um, about Venezuela's oil or Latin America more generally, right? The larger point is that all of this means that the people who have been most suffering, which are Venezuelans themselves as a result of the crisis that I mentioned before, are increasingly becoming overshadowed by these larger geopolitical concerns. What should we do now? Well, we, number one, we should certainly reject any calls towards direct military intervention. 
We know what that does in Latin America. We know what that has um, led, not just in Latin America, but elsewhere in the globe. But number two, there are actually existing mechanisms and structural um, uh, 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 or aid bodies, especially in the borders with uh, Colombia and, and Venezuela, that would actually be able to facilitate humanitarian aid if it were not actually overridden or um, um, underwritten by these larger regime change considerations, right? So you've heard from the International Red Cross, for instance, or other um, local and uh, humanitarian organizations that say, we cannot be participants to a larger political agenda, right, or a larger political project that aims towards an outcome that is ousting a particular government. Because if the humanitarian crisis is real, as it is, you cannot hold the people who are suffering through that humanitarian crisis subject to the changes in that political um, situation. You need to deliver the um, humanitarian aid immediately, right? And there are actually, again, organizations on the ground who um, are and have been, because of the migratory flows over the last year, year and a half, been in a position to be able to actually deliver some of this aid, but they've been increasingly sidelined, again, by this larger sort of political battle taking place. Um, the other thing is that there are, um, there are, even though they've been sort of uh, you know, muted because of this kind of zero-sum dynamic that I mentioned before, um, bodies that have emerged, for instance, there's a so-called international contact group that's spearheaded by the European Union, some countries of the European Union, Mexico, Uruguay, Costa Rica, and others, um, even though that some of these countries have taken sides in the Maduro versus uh, you know, Guaido affair, they've nevertheless understand that we need to de-escalate because otherwise we're moving in a direction of intervention which may have you know, short-term benefits but long-term de uh, deficits in terms of potential governability, um, the governability of Venezuela and the region more broadly. Right? Um, and so all this suggests that you know, we have to pay attention to and sort of uh, amplify the voices of those who internationally are calling for spaces not of negotiation, Right, because this has been something that the Maduro government has used very effectively in the past to delay and to continue to stay in power, but to exert a different kind of pressure both on both parties, on the part of the opposition to say, you must allow some sectors of Chavismo to have, continue to have a political life. It can't be a winner-take-all system because doing so would just undermine the possibilities for governability going forward. And of course, on the part of the Maduro government to say, you need to call new elections because not only were the previous elections unfree, but it's, uh, it's not at all clear constitutionally what actually gives, for instance, somebody like um, Juan Guaido the, the constitutional right to be able to dictate things like oil policy. The only thing that Article 233 actually, uh, uh, Constitution ha allows him to do is to create the conditions for new elections, right? So insofar as we increasingly see, for instance, um, you know, Guaido saying things like we're gonna appoint a new, um, uh, board of, of PDVSA, which is the national oil industry, or CITGO, which is primarily held by, uh, primarily owned by, um, uh, you know, uh, by Venezuela. This is not actually contemplated in those constitutional articles that the opposition has called upon to legitimize its, um, its position, right? So there, there's a real moment here of uh, not just crisis, which is the word that, um, the, the word du jour, but of uh, making sure that what's most necessary right now is to create the conditions for free and fair elections where some sectors of Chavismo do have a role, do have a say, in order to be able to create a debate about what the future of the country should be. Should it be along the lines of you know, austerity, greater ties to the United States, et cetera, et cetera, or should it be some sort of, um, you know, some, some different grounds on which the future of Venezuela is gonna be staked? Thank you so much. <laughs> permission to leave. <laughs> um, and I think we can continue for maybe five, ten minutes. Would I'm happy to. Okay. There. I'm done. <clears throat> what is, because you haven't mentioned that, um, the future of Venezuela within this movement or this uh, cartel mm -hmm. that have been called the cartel of, of de los soles. Oh yeah. You know what I'm referring to? Yes. What would be their, the, what is their position now 
And what would be their position in an opposition plus Chavism that you're proposing as the end goal? So just briefly, for folks who aren't familiar, so the Cartel de los Soles, so-called, it's not formal cartel, but um, it, uh, it's, um, it's a term that's used to call, uh, to refer to the networks of um, military participation in drug trades or other forms of illicit markets in Venezuela. One of the things that Maduro has done in order first to try to, to secure the support of the military, but also get people within the military to be included in his inner circle, is to appoint ridiculous numbers of generals. So Venezuela has a military of about 250,000, and it has something like 3,000 generals, right? Which you know, just does not in any sort of way uh, you know, hold to the actual operational um, affairs. So what does that mean? That means that people are appointed uh, as generals, and this is close to the Cartel de los Soles. It's called Cartel de los Soles because generals wear um, suns on, the, on their pallets, right? So Cartel de los Soles, Cartels of the Sun, mean that it's Cartels of the Generals. Right, and so what it means is that so generals are given basically a portion of access to the oil pie, right, or to the um, the increasing state presence in the economy by virtue, for instance, of saying you know you're going to re be responsible for um, uh, the importation of rice. So there's a general for rice, right, and so you know that of course, so this general gets access to dollars, and then the idea is that they control you know where they're going to purchase the, the rice from, whether it be Turkey or Uruguay or, or Mexico, and then they you know the the, tur the the rice arrives in the port, and then they're responsible to you know, for distributing that to you know throughout the population. As I said before, the incentives are so dramatic for um, corruption that you know now uh, many of these generals are completely tied into corruption, which of course means that they have a lot to lose with Maduro out of power. Right? So one of the things that the opposition has done, which has been really interesting, and one of the first things they did actually um, after January 10th was to announce a, or propose an amnesty law. The purpose of which was to say, all right, we know that what's keeping Maduro in power right now is the military, some of these generals. So how do we get some of these generals or others to flip on Maduro? Well, clearly they have a lot to lose. And one of the things that they have to lose is for instance, they could be tried for corruption or worse, human rights violations. And so we will grant you amnesty if you flip. The problem is that the law that's been proposed for amnesty does not meet international standards. And so this creates a confusion on the part of those who might otherwise take refuge in the amnesty law. Because they say, great, you might propose this law, but if there is an actual transition government, this amnesty is not going to be held up by international standards. So, or by you know, at, by the international um, at the international level. So I might be sitting in the same place today than I in six months in terms of uh, you know the potential to be arrested or worse. So that's that amnesty law holds promise, but because it's been so confusingly deployed in terms of its actual goal to try to flip some of these generals, it has not achieved its purpose. So what would be the role or the place of some of these generals? Um, in a, in, a, in a kind of interim government. So I have a sort of um, uh, a kosher <laughs> response, and I have a less kosher one. So my, my less kosher one is the generals in Venezuela, two things. So generals in Venezuela, like I said, they don't actually control a significant amount of power in terms of troops, because there's so many, right? There's many generals who don't actually control troops. They give an order, but it might be an administrative order. It's not an order to fire, right? So they, you know, even if they flip, and there's like in a couple who flip, they don't control any troops, and therefore that undermines the, the, the reach that they may have. But the second thing is that the people who actually matter, the ones who give orders, the ones who are going to be receiving the orders to fire, for instance, either against a foreign invader or um, you know, uh, popular sectors or, or the Venezuelan people, are the so-called comacates. So comacates in Venezuela refers to commanders, captains. Major, majors and lieutenants, right? It's middle ranks of the military who are the ones who actually enforce the, the orders that are carried out. Those, of course, are the people who have most to lose in, in, in carrying out some of these orders, and therefore for whom the, the amnesty law is most appealing, because they also have not been incorporated into the upper echelons of economic illicit power, right? So it would be interesting to see if the opposition targets them rather than the generals in terms of seeking some sort of, you know, you guys are going to be able to remain. The generals are done, but it's these comacates. You continue to have a role. You're the one who has to flip. 
The other thing about the, you know, the generals is that um, uh, in terms of you know, their, their role, what they could do, um, that was the kosher response. The non-kosher response is this one. Um, uh, perhaps you've, you've heard of, of these in coverage of Venezuela, um, colectivos. So colectivos refers to basically, um, anyway, there's a lot of confusion as to what they are, but let's just basically say that they are armed groups um, that exist outside of the, the formal structure of the state. That some are basically just paramilitary groups. Others have longer standing in community action, et cetera, et cetera, and so they have significant amounts of legitimacy. But they're all armed significantly, and they all operate outside the rubric of the state. And periodically, the government has called upon these colectivos to, for instance, partake of repressing um, uh, the opposition when it um, stages marches. And in addition, there is sort of this um, overinflated sense of threat of what the colectivos pose and what they might do in a transition scenario in terms of um, uh, creating um, instability, right? So the generals could easily say, you know what? My permanence in an interim government is conditioned by my ability to be able to quell those colectivos. So if I turn my, uh, my troops, if I control troops to on the colectivos in a transition scenario, that's what's going to grant me the opportunity to, to stay, right? So using the colectivos as a, as a sort of bargaining chip, right? But of course, that's not something that they would say publicly, and that's not something the opposition would agree to publicly. But certainly, the issue of these armed um, you know, non-state sectors is going to be a major one in any kind of transition scenario. And it, it seems like it could be a potential bargaining chip of, on the part of some of these military, uh, especially the upper echelons, to be able to say, OK, that's going to be my avenue through which I, I can remain. Um, thank you. Your presentation is excellent, and I think it's overdue. Um, what is happening in Venezuela is not new in Latin America. Uh, it happens in the Dominican Republic in the 60s. Yes. Um, and what happened is there is still side effect of how bad that was handled by the US uh, because it was a political gain by uh, the United States and supposedly uh, the Dominican Republic. But the civilians were still traumatized by what happened in the past. I think it's worth mentioning on a kosher, uh, not a kosher side of it is that you need to look at history yes. and listen because the population in Venezuela that is suffering is larger yes. than the generals yes. and the sons and yes. whatever groups that is organized. So organizing yes. the civilians is the power to be in order to gain political gain that Venezuela is overdue. Because in the 60s, where the Dominican Republic was going through all these issues, Venezuela was the mega for Latin yeah. America. And people were traveling mm -hmm. to Venezuela as a resource for survival. Mm -hmm. So it can be done, but I think the political um, power that has been imposed mm -hmm. uh, through history has to be put aside and let uh, give voice to the voiceless mm -hmm. and empower it through education and political empowerment. I love that. Um, and, and yes, my the Yabba that I wrote for the, the Times kind of speaks to that issue just very briefly, and then I'll take a couple more. Um, this is why the appointment of somebody like Elliot Abrams, a special envoy on Venezuela, is so alarming, right? Because again, as I mentioned, Elliot Abrams, um, whose record in Central America in the 1980s in terms of ostensibly promoting democracy and, um, and human rights, was really just about defeating communism by any means necessary. Um, what, that, just that, what that suggests is that there is this winner-take-all mentality that transcends any kind of medium-term or long-term um, uh, you know, scenario. And that's actually worse. So one of the things that we understand in, um, in history, through history, is that crises can always get worse. There's no natural <laughs> end point to a crisis. It's not like you say, well, how, how much worse can it get, right? It can always get worse. An intervention that doesn't have in mind sort of the future of governability is absolutely the recipe for worse. And we've seen it in the Dominican Republic. What we are seeing now in terms of the migration crisis in Central America is directly the product of those conflicts in the 1980s. Why are people leaving? Thank you. 
why are people leaving El Salvador in droves, Honduras in droves, um, you know, Guatemala in droves? They're leaving because of the policies that were implemented in the 1980s and 1990s that drove inequality, that drove poverty, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? Venezuela should not be this place 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And we're still in time not to have that happen precisely for the reasons that you mentioned, creating those opportunities on the ground for the people who have no voice to actually speak. I'll just take these two and then I'll try to work. So, so, so what would be your plan B or C? Yeah. Since uh, this government is so unpredictable yes. that honestly the invasion is still a possibility. Although if you can do a multi forces, yeah. Yeah. could be a possibility as, as is happening in Europe. Yes. What would be then the plan B or C because waiting one or two or three more years yeah. is not That's a solution either. Possible one. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So what would be your foreign policy for the U.S.? Should oh, we yes. just sit right oh, in? Um, so uh, um, what would be the plan B or the plan C? Um, so for myself, um, I think that the landscape in terms of international geopolitics has shifted so much over the last three and a half weeks in terms of pressure and incentive structures that thinking about some sort of negotiation that has a clear outcome, which is free and fair elections, which would require both sectors of the opposition and certainly of the Maduro government to concede. Maduro would have to concede giving power, and then the opposition would have to concede including some sectors of Chavismo. And they've already said it just a couple of days ago, the vice president of the National Assembly, um, um, <laughs> names of Venezuela are great. His name's Stalin Gonzalez. Um, but he's, he's a, if, yes, Stalin Gonzalez. Um, but he's you know sort of in the opposition. Um, he said we absolutely want Chavismo to participate in elections. But he was the first one to sort of say this publicly from these echelons of power. So that's hopeful in terms of you know making sure that that happens. It's not helpful when then subsequently Abrams or Mike Pompeo says the time for negotiation is over. The only thing we can do now is um, is action because that not only undermines the credibility of those claims that are coming from Venezuela, but also says to the generals to, or to others who might actually flip, well, who's in charge here? You know, is, is it Pompeo or is it um, Juan Guaido or is it Stalin Gonzalez? Who's actually, who do I respond to? And who do I have to see um, you know, in terms of responding to? So in terms of you know, plan B strategy, I think what's being pushed now by, again, some countries of the European Union, um, Uruguay and Mexico and Costa Rica in terms of the international contact group, which again is not just blanket negotiations, has a clear outcome in mind, that's absolutely a useful venue and should not be dismissed out of hand just because you know, Maduro has uh, you know, circumvented negotiations before. I think the landscape is different. So that's one scenario that I would give. Say that there is a multilateral uh, you know, intervention I completely agree with um, the lady who was just here that that might have some short-term benefits, but the long-term or even medium-term um, consequences in terms of government ability would be severe, especially because the opposition has still yet not made those contacts and links with popular sectors, significant actual links. And so that is a very tenuous link in terms of government ability going forward. Right? Um, uh, for the opposition, what I would say is start establishing those links right now. Don't just speak about humanitarian aid, although it's absolutely essential. Speak about what are we going to do in a year? What is the Venezuela that we see in a year's time? And what is your role in it after the humanitarian crisis? Right? To the other side, you know, what would be my policy towards the United States? Shut up. <laughs> just be quiet. Just be quiet. It seems like every time Rubio or Abrams or Pompeo or Bolton say something, it just adds more um, you know, uh, credibility to what had long been just ridiculous claims by Maduro about like economic warfare or US intervention. So when Trump talks about you know, the military option is on the table, that facilitates Maduro saying, you're rallying people behind his cause, right? Because it creates that credible threat. Um, and so to the extent that there are other places, you know, anybody else could take the lead and say, you know, here are the things that we have to do. And the United States could continue to exert significant amounts of pressure as it's doing through, you know, the sanctions is a different issue. Because I do think that the sanctions 
that have been announced are um, are well, they are increasingly there. It's clear that they are demonstrably the most severe sanctions imposed on any country in the in the history of the United States. For instance, in the case of Iraq in the 1990s, after the Gulf War, there was a few uh, food for oil program that allowed for some sort of uh, access by the Saddam regime to, to foodstuffs. That is not at all contemplated under this latest round of sanctions. So it's really just a, we are gonna completely starve, um, literally and figuratively, um, the Venezuelan um, you know, economy until the regime falls, right? And that's extremely dangerous. So to the extent that there could be you know, the, the United States absolutely has a role to play, but not in the way that it's being so vocal and has been um, to this point. Thank you very much. I have a little present for you by your former Five College colleague, William Taubman. Oh, wow, that's great. Well. That's fantastic. Thank you all. I hope you like the extra half hour. I figured he's going well, so we'll let him go. And watch for more information about Mark Hamley's event and our other events. Thank you for coming. <laughs>